what would you call that piano music? It's just underneath us here. Sad? Spooky? Ominous? Well, however you can characterize it, uh, seems to me we just need to begin this second Sunday in Lent, this rather frigid day, with prayer. Holy Spirit of God, how tempting it is to read the words of Scripture as if they were from an ancient page, written by someone long dead to people whose lives have long since been forgotten. Don't let us be fooled, O living one. Speak to us once again. May your words come alive in the reading here and now that we might hear them as fresh as they were written to us just yesterday by the one who loves us too much not to communicate. So we pray this in his name, that very same Jesus who was driven out to the desert and tested. Amen. Well, in last week's video, you might remember we read the quintessential passage for Lent, the 40-day fast and temptation of Jesus in the, in the wild, in the wilderness. It's found in all three synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Uh, just to review, Mark says that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert for the 40-day fast. But Matthew and Luke say it more gently, that he was led out there by the Spirit. Well, Mark doesn't give any details about what Jesus did out there other than hang out with wild beasts. But Matthew and Luke give us the full blow-by-blow -blow description of the scriptural chess match with the devil out there in the barren wild. Last week we read Luke's version, but this week it's Matthew's version in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, which gives you the Old Testament citations right there in the text. Now, Peterson refers to this passage as the test, a capital T, test. Here's what it sounds like. Jesus was led into the wild by the Spirit for the test. The devil was ready to give it. Jesus prepared for the test by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That left him in a state of extreme hunger, which the devil took advantage of in the first test. Since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him on top of the temple and said, Since you are God's sons, jump! The devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. He has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. For the third test, the devil took him to the peak of a high mountain. He gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. Then he said, They're yours, lock, stock, and barrel. Just fall to your knees and worship, mer worship me, and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was terse. Beat it, Satan. And he backed his rebuke with a third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only him. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. The devil left and the test was over. Then angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. Well, again, as we talked about last week, these stories we've heard since Advent about angel visitations and transfigurations and temptations weren't one-time video recordable historical events that happened just to Jesus. 
Now, these stories are far more important and powerful than that. The angels visit us all. The devil tempts us all. We've all seen the cartoons with the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other speaking into our ears. And the majestic glory of God is available to us all if we'll do the preparatory inner work, the spiritual inquiry that Jesus calls us to do as illustrated in this temptation story. Inner work and outer work are just convenient ways of speaking about starting points on the spiral of the spiritual journey, which we'll talk about in some depth in next week's video with a, a visual aid and all. As Jesus puts, us, puts it, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is entos you. The Greek word entos is marvelously ambiguous there, meaning both within and among, within each human being and among humans in spiritual community. So before we dig into this, uh, here is a sweet song by Linnea Good that's only been around for 25 years, found in our Voices United hymnal. Streets of living water. 
last week's video, I said that we have to be careful not to project modern psychological concepts onto this ancient story of Jesus in the desert, or any ancient story or myth for that matter. After all, psychological terms like ego and superego were coined by Sigmund Freud 1800 years after this story appeared in the Gospels, and they may not be relevant to the structure of the human personality of first century AD. I mean, back then, thoughts came to people from the outside rather than from an independent inner self of the kind that we think we have today. Humans 2,000 years ago understood and experienced themselves very differently than modern humans. In the first century, and for the next 1,000 or 1,500 years, people, well, in the Middle East and Europe anyway, understood themselves to be part of a rather rigid, superior framework, a divine world order. They experienced themselves from the temple, or later the church, and from the tribes, clans, and guilds that they belonged to. They were contained in these communities in the way that we aren't. Now, we can choose uh, to uh, take or leave church or any other organization, but in ancient or medieval times, they, they couldn't. If you were born a peasant, that's all you could ever be because it was ordained by God or the gods. So, you know, that's one of the reasons we have to be careful not to project our psychological, political, and economic notions onto something written so long ago. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that we can't take an ancient text, a Greek myth, uh, an Icelandic saga, or a Bible passage like this story of Jesus and interpret it. So, hey, let's just throw caution to the wind and plunge into this with our modern brains and our modern understandings. Now, the story of Jesus in the wild can be interpreted in lots of ways. I mean, politically, Jesus has shown all the kingdoms of the world and is tempted to become like Caesar if he'll only adopt Caesar's methods. Or second, for lack of a better word, shamanistically. Jesus defeats the evil spirits in an epic battle in the evil spirit's own arena. Or third, maybe cosmically, the Son of God vanquishes God's cosmic enemy, the fallen angel, Lucifer. And each of these interpretations is valid, or at least good arguments could be made for them, but none of them speak directly to our experience here in the 21st century. Another way of looking at this story is uh, by considering the name of the one doing the tempting, the tester. Satan, or in Hebrew, Hasatan, the adversary, the opposition, the accuser. As human consciousness has evolved, we've all become aware of an, an accuser inside of us rather than coming from the outside. And maybe you've heard some of the accusations that the accuser has made. You're not good enough. They'll find out you're a fraud soon enough. Or, you could have worked harder. Or, why did you work so hard? You should have spent more time with your family. Or maybe you've heard you'll never make it. You're lazy. You don't apply yourself. You're thinking too big. Drop those crazy dreams of yours and just be realistic. Anybody heard voices like that, other than me? Yeah, I mean, the accuser accuses us, and also working within us accuses others. Ah, she blew that whole deal for me. Why did she do that? Oh, those horrible people, they control everything. If they were gone, this world would be a better place. I gave him the best years of my life, and he betrayed me. I could have been a contender, if not what was done to me unfairly. 
Freud called this accuser the superego. Yeah, well, Freud spoke German and he called it das über ich, the over I, which is over the essential I am. The superego is an internalization of, par of parental figures, authority figures, cultural regulations and expectations. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, when you're a kid, the superego keeps you safe and under some control. The problem arises when we outgrow superego protection and its advice becomes inappropriate and uh, just accusative and critical. Like in the traditional mythology about Satan, the devil didn't start out bad. He was Lucifer, the light bearer, which is what that word means, the son of the dawn, until he outlived his usefulness and began to rebel against the very light itself. The inner work Jesus points to is learning to recognize and disengage from the inner critic, the inner accuser, learning to own our projections, both the positive and negative parts of ourself that are placed on others. We project these parts of ourselves on other people. The accuser comes to us in three ways, the uh, satanic trinity, if you will. First, as judgment, you're not applying yourself. You'll never make any self, anything of yourself or judging others. They did that to me. Second, as self-justification, you, you were right all along if they'd only listened. Or as medication, oh, you poor baby, you need a drink. These are the three uh, regents that take care of you until you're ready to take responsibility for yourself and discover who you really are. And there's always a kernel of truth to these accusations, aren't there? Which is why we believe them. And when we learn to defend against them, we find that they get more and more outlandish so as not to lose control of you. Superego accusations can be defended against in a number of ways. In a direct, confrontative way, uh, you know, you can drive it out. Hey, shut up. I'm working hard enough for me, for my family, and for my organization, so beat it. That can work sometimes. Or you can lead it out gently in a, you know, a kinder, gentler way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for helping keep my inner child safe and showing me how clever you are and reminding that inner child of her need to apply herself. But you know, she's grown up now and making her own decisions. The essential inner work is about uh, differentiating those accusative voices from your essential self, your inner Christ, your I am. Then noticing how you react to the superego voice. Do you collapse? Do you lash out with your own accusations? Do you try to argue with it intellectually? Do you try to defend it as well as yourself? I mean, essential inner work is learning to defend against the superego. And for some people, the direct confrontation works well. Get behind me, Satan. Beat it. Shut up. You know, that's disengaging through your own inner power. And for others, like me, I'll admit, the subtle approach works uh, far better. Oh, thank you for telling me that I'm not making the grade on this project, and you were right about that in my grade six science project in 1963. But now you can stand down. Well, once you can discern those accusative voices and defend against them, whether they come from inside your own personality or, you know, more likely from others' projections onto you that you internalize, well, then, like at the end of the scripture passage, remember that last line? The devil leaves you and suddenly angels appear and look after you. In other words, the accuser stands down and shuts up, and the inner guidance, God's messenger, 
which is what the word angel means, your inner guidance shines through you. So when you're feeling down, put upon, tired, angry, get curious about why. Get curious about who it is that's speaking to you. Is it one of the three regents, one of the satanic trinity? Because you have the power, all of us do, to quiet the accuser and find your I am beneath the noise. And when you find the I am within yourself or among yourself and others, who is it that you find? Oh, you know, inner work is so exciting and gratifying. And of course, like any work, occasionally, you know, drudgery. But becoming, of the, becoming aware of the deeper layers within us and moving toward the always unfinished business of self-integration puts us on the path of authentic outer work, mission and service, of which the United Church of Canada is so proud. Wait, isn't pride one of the seven deadly sins? Ah, beat it, Satan! It's a familiar hymn, uh, originally a Christmas hymn, Novel Nouvelle, we've sung it many times, then an Easter hymn, and now this recital of activity on the part of God's anointed one, this waiting, raging, healing, dancing, and then finally calling us to join the journey, both the inner journey and the outer journey. That's a wonderful, wonderful lyric. So let's pray, uh, remembering especially today our beloved Maxine, whose uh, earthly journey is over after having traveled it so very elegantly and faithfully. Let us pray. O blessed one, 
O blessed oneness, in this Lenten season, help us journey with Jesus, who was spirit-led, spirit-driven, into the wilderness of our own apprehensions. Show us how to face our demons of distrust, our resistance to your presence, and to find the courage to lean into the winds of grace so that we'll be uplifted by your freshness. Almost holy as we sit in isolation, we're bringing an audacious faith. Faith that's bold enough to break through everything and anything that would keep us from your healing touch. We know that so much conspires to keep us from reaching out beyond our self-conception, beyond social convention, beyond the systems that overpromise and underdeliver, to tap into your intention for wholeness. We ask you now in Jesus' name to give strength and skill to those developing, distributing, and administering vaccines and to bring us into a post-pandemic world with new ideas, new and better and sustainable ways of doing things. We're well aware that a year ago, we couldn't sustain the life that we were leading, we humans in the world at large. So we ask for newness and freshness and creativity in the name of Jesus, tempted, tested, and strong in the Spirit. He taught us rather boldly to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the strider over the high places, the God of many names, the one, the one who will never leave us or forsake us. May that one point to the path and in fact be the path that leads to wholeness and healing for all of us now and forever. Amen.